Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. People on Zoom, I knew that you were responding. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent. We are almost to Christmas, almost home. We're so glad you are with us today. This is the time when we gather community and we offer announcements. Is there anybody in the room who has an announcement? Okay. I just want to say something about this um, page in the bulletin. And those of you at home got it on your um, bulletin also. But um, this is from the Fresh Expressions. Now we've been involved, our church has been involved somewhat with Fresh Expressions, some people more than others. We've learned um, a lot of things about how to reimagine church and uh, you know, and what we do, and how we how we minister to people, and and how we um, <clears throat> reach other people and disciple them. That's the word I couldn't think of. So we're already connected to the Fresh Exper Expressions uh, program. Isn't right, but we'll use program. Um, and I get a million emails from them. Um, because they're always doing things. And you see those heads, any heads you see that are nodding, uh, yeah, they get them too. But this one caught my eye. Um, they, they are offering these tracks. And actually there are five tracks. Um, I highlighted two of them because I thought, wow, this is a manual. So on one page it's got Rethink Children's and Family Ministry. And here we are saying, all right, what do we do about Sunday school? You know, we're in a hybrid worship. What do we do about Sunday school? What do we about, do about children's education? What do we do about faith formation for adults? You know, how do we do things differently? Um, going back to what we did is not going to work. Even if COVID completely disappears off the face of the earth, it's a different time. So they're offering this three week uh, session and um, it just sounded really interesting to me. So I'm signed up and there are three or four other people also signed up and I offer this to you um, because let me know how well, however, however many other people might be interested because their rates um, vary depending on how many people sign up. So I don't wanna pay for, for four people at the four people price and then have two more come and now I have to I could have saved money. Anyway, so look at it and see if you're interested. The other side is um, rethink property assets and buildings. Well, hello, <laughs> you know, have we not been doing that also? Um, and so I put in there, you know, the, the um, highlights of what those sessions are. These are all done online. You don't have to go out anywhere. Um, and if you can't go to one of the sessions, they'll all be recorded and you can listen to them later. But you, you need to be registered in order to get access to them. So if you have any interest in at all, um, if you have questions, you can talk to me um, or you can talk to um, Kathy and Curtis because they have also done other Fresh, fresh Expressions things so they can tell you. It's generally pretty high quality stuff. So I endorse it, I invite you, um, think about it, sign up, thanks. Any other announcements from someone in the room? Does anyone on Zoom have an announcement to share? All right, let me um, call your attention to the back of the bulletin. There is um, an announcement there about Christmas Eve worship, which is coming on Friday at seven o'clock. What it doesn't say there is that I would really like to know if you don't normally attend worship in person, but you're coming in person on Christmas Eve, I'd like to know that. And if you are bringing people with you who aren't normally here in person. That would also be really helpful to know so that we can um, set up the sanctuary in preparation for that. 
The back of the bulletin gives you information about the Christmas Eve offering. We will actually have receptacles here and you can put a physical offering in, but um, it's a little bit easier on the financial folks if you can do it online ahead of time or you can do it um, ahead of time by mailing in a check. There are two places that we are designating the offering to go. One is to Focus Churches and the other is to USCRI. The, um, the funds sent to USCRI will be used to help resettle Afghan evacuees who are arriving and will continue um, to arrive in Albany. If you give online through the church website, your offering will automatically go to USCRI. Um, if you give any of the other ways, you can designate that in the memo line of your check. Also in the back of the bulletin, it, it reminds us that we do have worship next Sunday, a week from today, again, because we have worship on Sundays. That's kind of the thing we do here. Um, but it's, it's December 26th, it's the day after Christmas, and so we are embracing a casual mode. If you want to come in your pajamas on Zoom or in the room, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just wear um, soft pants or sweatpants or other comfy casual clothes, you are welcome to do that. And then the following Sunday, January 2nd, I will be on vacation and Jared Huguenot will be here to preach and to preside at communion. I think that is all of our announcements, so let us prepare for worship.
Good morning, church. I'm going to read the call to worship. Please respond after me. We are seeking a place to belong, the feeling that God is here in the room. We are seeking joy that overflows, the movement of the spirit, a hand to hold when alone in the dark. We are seeking the courage to love, the conviction to act in the face of injustice. We are seeking, but here in this space, take a deep breath. This is your sanctuary. God is here. We are found. Amen. God's love is like an open door. God's love is a streetlight that guides us. God's love is a worm bed to fall into. God's love is a table with room for you. God's love is a crackling fireplace. God's love is the sun that streams through the windows. God's love is the roof over our heads and the floor beneath our feet. God's love is a home for you and me, for neighbors and strangers, for family and friends, for enemies and partners. God's love is home for all. Today we light the candle of love to remind us of the truth. May it burn brightly in this space and even brighter in our hearts. Amen. Kids, come on up if you wish. Come on up. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Grandma, 
We've been telling a story about grammar, and I'm going to catch you up because some of you may not have heard it all. We won't say the whole story. Uh, but she got sick. She was in the hospital. She lost her apartment, so she had no place to live. And uh, she got visits from people from uh, the breakfast club where she served breakfast. And who, put them, who lifted them up to get her, them way up high because her window was on the eighth floor? Remember that? Big girl, yeah. So big girl did that. And uh, then grandma got better. And so uh, she was able to leave the hospital, but uh, she had no place to live. So she went to the homeless shelter. If you remember what that is, remember? A place where people who are still looking for a home, someplace safe where they can live. And that's sort of where we left it, right? That's a long story so far, and today's the last part of it. Okay, so uh, grandma uh, had, uh, was thinking, now what do I do to thank all these people at the homeless shelter and my friends at the breakfast club because they've been so nice to me? And she was thinking about that. And while she was thinking about that, Naughty Raccoon was very excited. And he came up and says, I have an idea, I have an idea. I want to have a new business. And it's Naughty Raccoon's elevator uh, tricks. So I'm going to ask Big Girl to help out. And she's going to take me around to uh, all the places I want to go, where people live on the 8th or ninth or 10th floor. And I'm going to do tricks outside their window. And they won't know how it happened. So I will write like boo on their windows or watch out for flying raccoons or raccoons rock. I'll do something tricks. And grandma said, you know raccoon, that's a good idea, but let's not do tricks. Let's have a new business called the higher ground. Okay. And big girl said she would, would do it. And people from the breakfast club and from the homeless shelter, they would work for the higher ground. And they would do things that were up high that nobody else could do. So big girl would take them, put them way up high. Like if there was a cat stuck in a tree, who would you call? Higher ground, right? If, if you wanted to uh, say hello to somebody who was on the 10th floor and the elevator was broken, how would you say hello to them? Higher ground, right? So that's how, that's what she thought. And they started to do a great business. And they did so well that some of the people didn't, weren't homeless anymore. They had enough money to get their own place. So it was a great new business. But Grandma was still homeless. So what are we going to do about Grandma? Could people could give money. Well, I have an idea, OK? So in this, in this sanctuary, there is a, a space we haven't used. It's kind of a glass-walled high-rise for little people. If you look over there, see that what people call a bookcase? It's really not a bookcase. OK. It's got a glass wall, and there's some shelves. And I think Grandma could live in there or over there. So, but in order to do that, stand up. I am going to now deputize you as uh, voting members of Emanuel Baptist Church. I am going to officially call an Emanuel Baptist Church meeting, even though there hasn't been a two-week warning. And I'm going to ask everybody else to stand up, who, who, are, who are voters. And here's the resolution. Whereas the Hebrews were homeless for 40 years in the desert. Whereas Mary and Joseph were homeless when Jesus was born. Whereas Grandma is now officially homeless. Emmanuel Baptist Church votes to give her a permanent home in our new high rise. All those who say yes, please stamp your feet, clap your hands, and say amen. amen. Okay, let's go, let's go over there and see if there's a place for Grandma. Okay, so we'll get her up high so people can see her, and maybe even on the video. And we'll, uh, and Grandma is so happy to be in her new home, and it's going to be her new home for a long time. We might put it inside, 
next week. We'll see. Just but, in case it rains. Mm -hmm. Just in case it rains. Just in case it rains. Right now she's on the roof, so we don't really want to keep her there. Okay. So you can all go back to your seats. And everybody, just remember, uh, this is a story about Mary seeking sanctuary. She needed someplace safe to go, okay? We found a safe place for Grandma, and the whole theme of today is, come on home. Amen. reading the scripture from Luke chapter 1 verses 39 through 55. At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored as the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. 
And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoice, rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel remember to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Amen. This is why I gave up wearing earrings. Okay, there we go.
Testing, there we go. This is the time when we share uh, prayer concerns with each other. So I would invite us, as we have been doing, uh, to start with those in the room. So if you have a concern to share, if you would come to the microphone, I will back away. I have um, a couple of concerns I wanted to share, and there are pictures to go along with them. So last Sunday we uh, mentioned the communities that were devastated by tornadoes. Particularly we mentioned Mayfield, Kentucky. So last Sunday when we were gathered here in this space for worship, three of the downtown Mayfield churches gathered for an outdoor service. They were um, in a space that maybe still is a parking lot, used to be a parking lot um, between the two buildings that you see on the screen. Um, the top one is the former First Presbyterian Church, and the one on the bottom is the former First Christian Church. Both of those buildings are, are, have been or will be demolished um, in the aftermath. And so those stories will fade from the news, but those people in Mayfield and lots of other communities will be recovering for a long time. You may have read, as I did, um, about a neighborhood in Kentucky that was particularly hard hit. It happened to be a, a neighborhood uh, which has historically been settled by immigrants. So um, in a previous wave, the, the people living there were from Bosnia. Now they are from Myanmar and more recently Afghanistan. And there, were, um, there was significant loss of life in that community. So again, we just want to continue to remember them. And then I also wanted to share with you um, the story of this woman. Her name is Oja Barros. She lives in Brazil. She is a pastor and she teaches New Testament at the Center for Biblical Studies. She and her husband, Wellington Santos, are pastors of a Baptist church in Brazil that was disfellowshipped in, I think, 2016 for being welcoming and affirming. Last Saturday, Oja performed a wedding for two women. And since then, she has received credible death threats and her husband and her two daughters have also been threatened. Oja and Wellington have been here in this sanctuary. They are friends of Lynn and Peter's and uh, they were visiting Emanuel Frieden's. They were here for a week. They came over and I met them and um, my Portuguese is really not existent. So, um, so Peter uh, did some translating for us and we had a brief conversation. Um, I talked with Peter this week and Peter had talked with her and he said that she sounds honestly scared but also resolute in her um, position and her decision to have um, taken the stance for inclusion and to have performed this wedding. So I would invite our prayers for Oja and Wellington and their daughters and, and their church. Let's pray together. Holy God, our prayers are often one lovely act of seeking. We bow our heads, we close our eyes, and we seek. We seek you, we seek belonging, we seek connection, we seek sanctuary. We want to breathe easier in your presence and we want to find ourselves laughing with good news too good to keep inside. So today we pause our seeking to simply give you thanks. Thank you for the Elizabeths in our lives, the ones who have been there when we needed them most, the ones who have blessed us with joy, allowing our happiness to take up space, the ones who have opened the door for us and ushered us in. And thank you not only for the Elizabeths in our lives, but for the strangers who have cared for us. 
for those older and wiser who paved the way before us. And for individuals who share no relation to us but love us like family. Our lives are undoubtedly better because of them. Thank you, God, for an afternoon of caroling and friendship. Thank you for Jan's good, Jane's good spirits and her progress. Thank you for the witness of Oja and Wellington in a very difficult place. Gracious God, we also pray for those who don't have an Elizabeth in their life. We pray for those who do not have a hand to hold in the dark or a front porch to show up on or even a porch to call their own. We pray for those making big decisions who carry that fear and anxiety alone. And we pray for all who know loneliness just now. We pray for the Wagner family and the Triform community. We pray for our sister Leanne for good energy, for Michelle facing surgery and a scary procedure. We pray for those recovering, rebuilding, experiencing the trauma of having lived through the tornadoes that they did, and for those who are grieving. We pray for those who will travel this week. Travel seems more fraught than ever, and a lot of people will be in the air and on the road. So we pray for safety and kindness. Wrap your arms around all of these needs, O oh God. Circle back again and again, dwelling tenderly in the wounds of their hearts until healing is found. Open our eyes so that we might see the needs in our own backyards. Thank you for being our safe place. Thank you for always welcoming us home. Amen. What happens after the angel leaves? The Bible rarely gives the kinds of details that I want. So the angel appears out of nowhere and says, do not be afraid, as they always do. And then they say whatever it is they came to say. And you're terrified, of course, but you're trying not to show it because they told you not to be. What happens right then, right after they leave. Do you have a panic attack? Do you have to lean against the wall to hold you up so you don't fall down? Or do you go somewhere to throw up? Maybe you crawl back into bed and pull the covers over your head and just pretend that it was a dream. We do not know what Mary did immediately after the angel left her. But we do know that within a short time, she was on her way to Elizabeth. Elizabeth is married to a priest. Her male ancestors were priests. Luke describes her as righteous and blameless before God. So maybe when you've been visited by an angel, one of the first things you might do is go see a religious person someone who is close to God and may understand the mysteries of angels. 
Now, if we didn't already know this story, we might anticipate a different reaction. We might expect that the righteous religious Elizabeth would speak harshly to her young, unwed relative. I wonder if Mary might be afraid of that, too. She has made this journey of 80 or 90 miles, climbing the Hebron Mountains, perhaps while coping with morning sickness. That might be evidence of how desperate she is to find someone who will receive her with kindness. She takes a risk and goes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth does not cluck her tongue and mutter something about young people these days. She does not scold Mary. She welcomes her with open arms. She blesses her. She recognizes the bonds that they share. They have each believed a promise delivered by an angel. How wild is that? What an inexpressible relief that must have been for Mary. She could let down her guard. She was safe with Elizabeth. Maybe you know that feeling. Maybe at a time when you greatly needed it, someone defied expectations. They didn't get mad. They didn't judge. They just offered you space to pull yourself together. It was a hot afternoon, and the two boys were looking for a cool place to hang out. So they jimmied the lock on the back door of the church and walked through the sanctuary and down a staircase. Once in the cool basement of the church, they started shooting pool. They had done this several times before. But on this day, something moved in the shadow of the room, and then the pastor stepped forward. The boys were caught, and they were afraid. But then the pastor smiled. Of all the people in this neighborhood, you guys are trying the hardest to get into this church. He reached into his pocket, and then he pulled out a key. Here he said, come in any time you want. That episode changed the lives of those two brothers and their whole family. Their parents became very active in that church. A multi-generational history of alcoholism was interrupted. The youngest of the boys, Roger Swanson, grew up to become a pastor and a denominational executive. Sanctuary is the gift of welcome and acceptance and belonging and safety. It can be powerful, even life-changing. Elizabeth provides sanctuary for Mary, which enables Mary to become sanctuary for God. Mary becomes Jesus' safe person. She is the one who gives birth to him when he is far from home. She is the one who flees to Egypt with him and with Joseph when Herod threatens his life. She worries over her teenage son when they are separated on that trip to the temple. She coaxes him to save the party at Cana. And she stands by brokenhearted, angry, and helpless when he dies. Other people may be intimidated or threatened or in awe of the amazing adult Jesus, but not Mary. She knows him too well. She is his safe person. Sanctuary is an expansive word. We use it in all kinds of ways. We use it to talk about this room where worship takes place. It's also used about places that rescue hurt and endangered animals. And people are finding sanctuary in motels and Red Cross shelters in the aftermath of the tornadoes. 
Some churches have provided sanctuary for months on end for people at risk of deportation. Sanctuary is the gift of welcome and acceptance and belonging and safety. It is not just a place, it is also the people who create safe places for others. Pastor Stan is one of those people. He is a pastor who provides sanctuary for queer and trans people. That safe space often happens in person as he travels around the country and speaks in churches. It also happens on a daily basis online. People who are afraid to be themselves, afraid of the reaction of their families and friends and their churches, find him. They find him through social media or by referral from someone else who was recently in a similar situation. And he's often contacted by the parents of LGBTQ people, parents who want to respond with love, but who are conflicted by what they understand the Bible to say. About a year ago, Pastor Stan was contacted by one of those moms. I don't know these people's real names, but I'm going to call the daughter Sue. So Sue had asked her parents to follow Pastor Stan on Facebook. He, on his Facebook page, often um, explained biblical texts and shared messages of welcome, especially to LGBTQ people. Sue told her parents that Stan was an evangelical pastor who had shifted his position on sexual orientation and inclusion, and she wanted her parents to follow Pastor Stan because she wanted them to consider making that shift themselves. So the parents did what Sue asked, and they were surprised by what they found. Because you see, Pastor Stan has a life beyond his ministry. He has adult children, and he has parents. And when Sue's parents started following him, his posts were almost all about his mother and his family's journey with her dementia. Well, at that same time, as Sue's parents started reading his post, Sue's paternal grandmother had recently died of Alzheimer's, and her parents were actively caring for her maternal grandmother, who also had it. Sue's parents were incredibly touched by the connection between Pastor Stan's experiences with his, mo- with his mother and their own journey. His sharing of that difficult and tender time ministered to them in a powerful way. They felt that connection so strongly that they were hesitant to hear his position on inclusion. They knew that they didn't agree with him, and they were afraid that if they acknowledged this point of disagreement, that it would diminish this ministry that they had already received. But because of that ministry, they wrote to him, and they said, we have reluctantly opened our hearts and minds to consider that maybe, just maybe, we might have been wrong. We both know if we are ever where your mom and mine are now, of our four children, our gay child will be the one to sing hymns with us and soothe us through the long and lost days and nights. We are grateful to have found you when we did. We have a sense that God is speaking to us through you in ways we could never have heard if it were not for your mom. Almost a year later, they wrote to Pastor Stan again, saying that they had become fully affirming of their gay daughter. So I thought about Pastor Stan's experience with that family. And I thought about Mary and Elizabeth. 
Sue's parents were more ready to hear Pastor Stan because they made a connection over a shared vulnerability, a shared sense of gradual and impending loss. And then I realized that maybe Elizabeth is more ready to receive Mary because of Elizabeth's own vulnerability. She is, after all, also anticipating an unexpected pregnancy and wondering about how she will be judged for it. So I'm wondering about the connection we make between the ways that we extend sanctuary, the ways that we make it safe for other people, and also the ways that we share our own journeys, especially the hard parts. I want to affirm, Emmanuel, as a congregation, you have truly been sanctuary for many people, people from all kinds of walks of life. It has happened in people's homes and in private conversations that I have never heard, I'm sure. But it has also happened on the first day that someone came to worship and then I was the one that they told how grateful they were to have found this safe place. I can identify three major groups of people who have found sanctuary here. One was people fleeing persecution and danger in another country. As they sought asylum, which is another word for sanctuary, their journey brought them to Albany and then to us. Some are part of us today, and some have moved on. A second group are LGBTQ persons whom we have officially welcomed since the 1990s. It is unfortunate but true that they still seek sanctuary because many places are still not safe. And the third folks that I might identify are those who lost their spiritual homes or felt unwelcome in their faith communities as their understanding of God and the Bible and the meaning of faith made a big shift. And when they realized that their theology was no longer represented in the communities which once had been sanctuary to them, it was like a tornado had pulled the foundation out from under them and they were in a kind of free fall. But some of those folks found a place to stand again among us. I affirm this congregation for providing sanctuary to all those folks and many more, and I trust that we will continue to do so. Those efforts have not been without cost already, I know. But I suspect that if we are to continue reaching out with the gift of welcome and acceptance and belonging and safety, if we are to connect with those who now desperately need sanctuary, it will probably require from us even more willingness to be vulnerable, to be our authentic, messy, broken, and brave selves. Scholars sometimes see this scene between Mary and Elizabeth as the first gathering of the community of Jesus, a kind of microchurch. Paul Simpson Duke says, it invites us to recall how much we need each other, to draw fresh courage from each other, and to celebrate all that we share as bearers of the promise together. If these two women are a prototype of church, they certainly embody both how improbable and how subversive the church can be. So, beloved ones, may we, like Mary, go to each other and risk May we, like Elizabeth, receive each other and bless. May we find welcome, 
belonging, acceptance, and safety as we recognize the deep, deep love of Christ among us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn is O Little Town of Bethlehem. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we sing it. Friends, I invite you to uh, move from this space to the Fellowship Hall for, uh, I believe there are particular uh, snacks and treats today, so uh, enjoy that time of fellowship. And would you receive a benediction? May you live within the sanctuary of love these coming days. May love call forth the songs you sing. May your power rise. May love be within you and surround you. 
May you know, deeply know, the abundance of God's steadfast love. And may you live within the welcome and acceptance and belonging and safety of love. Amen.